This is the NACIO uh, SDK meetings for February 20th, 2024. <laughs> uh, I guess before we start it, uh, does anyone have anything that they want to uh, talk about? Again, I, I should have a agenda doc somewhere. But pushing back week by week. Okay, if not, then um, as we talked about last week, this meeting is mainly Tao and, uh, and, and Vim um, presenting, or, or if, if they have a demo, demoing uh, what they have in, in, in terms of addressing a, a list of issues that we have for, for SDK. So um, given that Vim is not back yet, I guess. Um, so Tao, would you mind getting started? Kick it up. <laughs> I don't mind. Uh, my, uh, <laughs> my my demo is going to be very uh, short um, okay. and hopefully to the point. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'll just mention that in our uh, SIG2 meeting tomorrow, I'm going to go into this in more depth. But I can show, um, yeah, I'll, I'll show you the basic concept. Um, I'm going to mm -hmm. take a risk and share my entire screen. Oh, yeah, go ahead. And everybody is going to ignore uh, corporate secrets. <laughs> um, OK. All right, so um, <clears throat> so this little demo is part of this uh, project I'm working on called TKO, which is kind of a rewrite of the core of Nafio to explore various ideas of scalability, et cetera, <laughs> and uh, new ways to do specialization pipelines. So there's a whole bunch of stuff there. So I'll, I'll go into detail tomorrow over everything. But I wanted to show you just the specific thing that I'm doing with Helm exactly as a POC to try this idea. So here I have a bunch of uh, packages, all my example packages. And here's a free 5GC SMF package. I have a UPF that I created. If you look at the workload YAML, kind of just a regular Kubernetes uh, stuff, right? I'm showing you the UPF first because it doesn't use Helm. <laughs> then I'll show you how Helm is a little different. Uh, here I have a namespace. Uh, resource, right? Familiar to everybody, standard Kubernetes and standard Kubernetes deployment. Um, <clears throat> for the namespace, <clears throat> some of you probably know, you do need to set the name because uh, the kept function set namespace, which we will use here, uh, will error out if it doesn't have a name. So you need at least a placeholder. So I'm just putting an underscore. So the, the specialization pipeline is pretty familiar. This will be filled up. And uh, then we get a namespace. <laughs> Right um, here, you notice the namespace is missing. This is OK. The set namespace function will set this. So the set namespace function will set the namespace for all of these intelligently. Right? It knows for namespace resources to change the name. And it knows for other resource types that are namespaced resource types, it knows that it should add a, a namespace uh, metadata here. Right? That, that's very familiar to all of us. Right. Let me show you how it's a little bit different with Helm. Um, so for the SMF, I decided to do the same thing, but with Helm. So again, I have the namespace, and I have the placeholder here just so uh, so the kept function won't error out. And then uh, instead of a deployment, I have a Helm chart resource right under workloadnefio.org. Again, this is a POC. This is not standard Nefio stuff. This is kind of an invention. So the Helm chart. Um, I have to give it a name, but I give it in the spec a repository for the Helm chart and um, the chart name. And this is where it's interesting. I give it parameters, and this is the uh, the values.yaml, right? The, these are the inputs to the, the Helm command, right, that it combines with the chart. Now, this is I, I gave this demo here because this is such a common use case, right? Almost every Helm chart has as one of its inputs the namespace. Right? Where do you want the chart to actually go? Of course, there are charts that might work with multiple namespaces if they're deploying stuff in a few places. But it's very common for a chart to deploy everything it needs in a single namespace. right? And usually, there's some sort of parameter called namespace, or in this case, namespace override for this uh, chart. <laughs> By the way, this isn't a real SMF that I'm deploying. I'm just uh, deploying MySQL. <laughs> just I was looking for a, a ready-made chart that just works. Um, but here's the thing, right? So 
and part of specialization will help the cat function update this, right? The set namespace function, but it won't know what to do with this because this is not a standard Kubernetes resource and it doesn't know that this is namespaced or not namespaced. And in any case, adding a namespace here is irrelevant because we don't need the namespace here. We need the namespace as a specific parameter that we know about in the values.yaml, right? So, so this has to be crafted specifically. Um, now here you see the function, I'm jumping ahead a bit, but I wanted to show you the more standard way to do this that we do in FEO right now and is supported here as well as what I call push, pushing the parameter in, right? As part of our specialization pipeline, just like we run the cat function here that updates the namespace name, we can also write a cat function that will update this specific parameter, right? Pushing it in. Um, it would have to be very, very specific to this Helm chart, right? To the specific resource. Why? Because every Helm chart is different, has different parameters, different things we want to inject. So in this case, in this, uh, in this POC, um, I have the ability to write these plugins, preparation plugins in Python. So here is the preparation plugin for the SMF, where right now I just, uh, it's not very interesting, but there's, some SDK stuff here that might be interesting to talk about in the future. But the preparation function here, all it does is verify that this is indeed an SMF uh, resource, the one we were looking at. And all it does here is update the status with some simple Python stuff and sets it as prepared and it's done. So here I could potentially, uh, I have access to all the resources in the package and uh, I can inject the value for the Helm chart, pull it from one place, put it in another place, right? This, this is how we work right now in FEO, right? We, we, we expect you to create a, a hook into the uh, specialization pipeline, either with a cap function or with a controller, and then you can manipulate and do whatever you want. Um, this is not overly hard, especially here where you can write just simple Python scripts, but it still requires to, you know, insert something into the pipeline and, and yeah, <laughs> do other things. So, what I wanted to show, finally, we're getting to the demo. What I wanted to show was, uh, you know, uh, our whole point is to make simple things simple, right? Uh, if all you need to do is copy a value that will be available here to here, then why not give an expression language <laughs> that you can just do it, right? So this doesn't, expression languages are all obviously very tiny DSLs. They can't do 100% of everything you'd be able to do in a full bone blown plugin like this. But um, for simple things like this, which are very common use cases, this is just so much easier, right? So the idea here is that I created um, this expression language in this case is implemented in Python. The reason is that uh, this Helm chart, it's under workload.nefio.org eventually gets handled by the uh, scheduling plugin, right? So it's actually not pulled as part of the pipeline, but pulled at the moment of deployment. So by the way, in the expression language, you could possibly do things that pull from the local cluster, right? Um, in this case, I'm just pulling another resource from here. I can show you how this expression language is implemented. This is a very uh, POC-like thing. So under SDK, uh, here's how it works with Helm. <laughs> so it actually just calls the Helm command line here. <laughs> uh, you can see user bin Helm install. Uh, but here it actually goes through all those parameters that we just saw and calls evaluate expression on them. And we can see the evaluate <laughs> expression. Please don't laugh, but I'm just doing a Python eval here, which uh, Six Security will be horrified about, but this is a POC, so I'm allowed <laughs> to do whatever I want. Uh, so yeah, this is the get function that you see called in the uh, expression. And yeah, I just wrap the expression with these uh, double curly brackets to kind of mimic uh, <laughs> the uh, Jinja uh, way of doing things. So yeah, here it is. So here's the expression. This is actually just Python code. So you can run potentially any Python code you want here. What it does, it calls get. So it looks for the first resource that is of type this is the GVK, so the group is empty, version v1, kind namespace, gets it, dot metadata, and dot name. 
yeah, so it pulls it in here and that's just exactly, yeah, and then it sets it with set JSON to the Helm command. Okay, so of course, different implementations. This is part of the, uh, the kind scheduling uh, plugin, which works directly with the clusters. If, for example, you were working with um, config sync or having another kind of indirect way to work with the workload clusters, then you would have to evaluate that expression maybe elsewhere, right, before sending it, et cetera. Uh, the point being that that's an implementation specific thing, but if, if you specify that expressions are allowed and help put parameters, then you can find a place to put the implementation. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. This does work. <laughs> Um, but I wanted to show that there are two ways to potentially uh, uh, handle this injection, right? So obviously we want to support full-blown plugins, right? Uh, full-blown ways to do uh, specialization where we can inject anything we want anywhere. But for more trivial use cases, why not just give a way to pull data exactly in? and avoid even using the SDK, right? This is totally a user uh, of a packaging implementation. Uh, that's it. I think uh, um, Wim has something similar, probably a little bit different. So it'll be nice to see his, uh, his version of this as well. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, I, guess, well, I guess before then, is there any questions from, uh, from folks on, on Tao's demo? Yeah, so, by so, the way, so, so, so let's let's take it. So, so this would be creating so expressive language for simplistic, more static uh, a replacement of uh, um, so so that so what what we need it for, obviously, for SDK perspective, is there uh, there are resources that are coming in, um, NF deployment plus the vendor extension uh, pieces, uh, and then we want to generate a values.yaml off of that. So I think that's, mm -hmm. that's our core case. Um, and there are Although not that... just that, not just mm -hmm. that. I mean, any kind of CRD could potentially pull data elsewhere if you're filling in a CR. So it's not just uh, inputs for Helm charts, it's inputs for any custom anything. Oh, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So, so, so the, the, the tools is, is, is generic. Uh, for our, our particular use is, uh, on, on this case, the replacement are needed because when you, when you get a NF deployment, you get the values of uh, vendor extensions. You want to be able to fill out the values at YAML, and that's the that's the part that filled out the business logic, basically, um, that um, that the vendors would have to implement. Uh, so they can they can put that in expressive language, um, or they can write it again, as you said. See, I think Stephen, the way I would phrase it is this: right, we have mm -hmm. a schema. I, let's say the values of YAML could be a schema, but let's say you know the parameters that values of YAML need, mm -hmm. right? For a particular Helm chart, right? So they are known up front. Mm -hmm. What you yeah. do here is basically, so so normally in our case, we get NF deployment. That's our hook, right? Mm -hmm. So we get that. In NF deployment, you have references, you have other metadata, if you will, mm -hmm. that you yeah. need, that you have to consume. And that data is potentially input to that value.yaml file. So what, what you need uh, with this type of tools is, uh, in uh, in particular to, to the business logic that we have, is first of all, you get NF deployment, right? In mm -hmm. that, let's say there is config refs. Let's take it easy, right? Yeah, of course. Let's say you have two config refs. You need to fetch them, right? Mm -hmm. Based on the input that you get, right? Because that it's actually another schema, which is config ref, so which based on the schema that you have, right? So mm -hmm. based on that data, you basically pick parameter from place number one, pick the parameter from place number two. You potentially have to do a comparison or something like that, right? And based on that, you get values.yaml. So in other words, mm -hmm. what you do is you have a bit of, so that's what I call the business logic, right? So mm -hmm. you basically take part A and B, and then you sometimes say, okay, if this is to value x you do pay, uh, this and then and and so on and so forth so mm -hmm. to the point that you actually get i have your all the parameters that you need for values of yeah mm -hmm. that's i think in a nutshell what has to happen right yes so i was i was looking for how that tools from tau maps into that particular use case that was that was the uh, that was the thinking so let's maybe do first. Let's show the dim. I let's maybe okay, yeah, go ahead. Uh, maybe maybe just quickly uh, add to that. Um, so 
I showed an example of a, a function in the expression language that pulls data from the other resource. But of course, functions can do anything, right? You can, mm -hmm. uh, depending on how your SDK is built, you can inject, say, a custom function, right? Even that pulls data from some other resource that you're using to put into the parameters of AML. For example, you could have a function that calls, uh, um, um, you know, an IPAM system, right? And gets an IP address, right? So there's, this can really become very rich, right? The, the basic approach is pull versus pull, as I see. Push, <laughs> sorry, versus pull, right? So you can make pull very rich indeed and even provide as part of your expression language a whole bunch of useful functions that could be used to pull data from all kinds of places within the, uh, you know, pull site information, right, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah. So anyway, yeah. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Zim. All yours. <laughs> yeah, so I... I mean, the approach is similar, I think. I, I, but so, yeah, my inspiration, wait, so I need to share my screen. I don't have a full blog demo yet, right? Because uh, I have- No reached. problem. <laughs> so, okay. So I built a tool called Kform, right? So Kform is basically inspired. If you look, so people familiar with Terraform, they will see 95% the same, okay? Um, and why did I do that? Is because Terraform is very well known. I think it's the most used infrastructure as code tool out there, right? So I said, okay, uh, first of all, so what I did initially, I said, okay, can I use Terraform as this, right? And then what, what you see is that Terraform, I, so why did I not, so, use Terraform as is, because Terraform uh, uses its own schema language. So, so the main change that I did, I actually all the code is not, I, so there is nothing of Terraform uh, in here, but um, I said, okay, it's this tool is 100% KRM focused, right? So what does that allow us to do is because we have schemas already from KRM, we have open API. So based on that, information you actually uh, don't need to build another schema to basically uh, do something with a krm resource right so if you have the schema just use the schema right don't come up with another thing now then <clears throat> so i i one of the things that you that of course you have to do is that okay map that logic of terraform so if you look on how terraform works so i did a few changes so if you look to terraform they have i so they start with what they call a variable right which is actually an input so they have a so they have a few resources which are called and so they have resource blocks right so you have resources which is a variable local output module data and resource right so there's probably a few more but these are the main ones and so, so I basically do exactly the same, right? So if you see here, so I started, I, so I built a demo basically to show the principle somehow on how it works. So it, in essence, this would be a package, right? So I just made two resources. I put here a workload cluster. So this is our regular resource, right? As this, and there is an input variable uh, file here that you use to customize it. So if, so the way it is uh, built right now is that if you don't put any metadata, the resource that I'm using is what I call an output resource. So that is the thing that is going to be uh, rendered inside of the cluster or is going to be your output that is going to be used, right? And then, so what you uh, basically do is that uh, you can use input or you can use actually any resource here that uh, you then use, uh, you can use the data from to actually manipulate something else. So for example, in this resource, what you see is I use input.context colon zero. So basically, so if you look to the data, so input, so it's basically an input resource. Context is the name, right? You put the first, first uh, zero is the first one. So you could actually build also a list of these resources and basically say, I want, 
uh, you can iterate over it. So I'll show you an iterator function in a bit. Um, but this is actually, if you look to the syntax that I'm using here, it's 100% Terraform, right? So input.context and then any data that you see here. So data cluster name. So I basically use example as my input by default, right? So that's here. I also take the namespace, right? From metadata.namespace. So basically here it's example. And uh, here I put a revision, right? So I put here some other data. So revision number uh, X, right? So if I go to my example one and I render this, right? I actually get an output with the data changed, right? Okay, so that's fairly simple. So now I can also uh, take, so this is, I, so if you look to this input of variables, so this is what I, I call default parameter. So if you build a package and you say, if, if I have no other context, that's what you're going to get, right? Now, what you can do is you can say, okay, I'm for this context, my cluster name or my revision or my namespace, I want to change, right? So you can basically say, so instead of using the default parameters that are in the package, you can actually get other data. So you see here that I used, I now, based on this input that I uh, received, I generate uh, a different output, but with the same package, right? So you, in other words, you can change the context that you use to actually manipulate the resources, right? So that's example number one, right? The second example that I was preparing is okay, that's nice, right? So just the parameter uh, change. I would like to do some more complex stuff, right? So I want to say, take this cluster name, this workload cluster, and then I concatenate and stuff like that. So, so I'm using, uh, the expression language that I use is, is based on Cell, which is actually a Google-based uh, product that is also used inside of Kubernetes for, uh, these days it's used for extensive validation and mutation. Uh, so instead of using webhooks, you use these functions. So you can do like mutation logic and stuff like that. So it's actually a very... Uh, it's a language like Lua and stuff like that's optimized for this type of behavior, right? So what is nice with that is that you can actually write your own functions. Uh, so cell comes with a huge list of stuff, right? But you can actually add additional functions if you want, similar to how you do in like gold templates and stuff like that. And so you can change the, the context on how it works and stuff like that. So here, for example, I... I wrote my own function, which is a concatenation, so it was not available. So it basically, I want to concatenate uh, the strings that I'm getting here, and I want to separate it with a dash, right? So if I move to example number two, right, and I do that, so so you can so generate uh, the context, and now you see that my name is basically a little bit more complex, right? Um, so then uh, the next question is okay. What I so if you look to to Terraform, they have a context of, for example, um, so they have this. I so the, you can actually build for loops, right? So let's say I want to have account. So that's the 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 attribute that Terraform uses to do uh, iterate. So let's say a for loop, right? So you I, they have two attributes. One is count. The other one is. Um, is for each, right? So I, I use exactly the same names because uh, for people familiar with Terraform, they will be very familiar uh, with that thing. So what I'm doing here is, so you can basically use additional annotations like these additional attributes. And so I can, for example, say, uh, I want to have a account, which is then variable, and I want to generate uh, data. So what happens is, I uh, people familiar also with Ansible and, and Terraform. So count as a is a keyword that is then I count of index is basically the the number, right? So you have access to the iterations that are happening under the hood for you, and you can use them to actually manipulate your context, right? So if I would use this example, right? Um, so what I'm doing right now is I generate 
five of these resources, right? And I change the name using that index and stuff like that, right? So, so, so this all comes out of the box. You don't have to build any new logic, no functions and stuff like that, right? And then what you can also do, for example, I, the last example that I have, you can actually build conditions using that terminology. So for example, count here will I, so this resource, so if this data is set to VLAN, I want to render this resource. If not, I don't, right? So you can actually change the, so there is some, so basically you have both conditions, you have iterations and you have manipulation functions to, to actually, uh, yeah, see whether this uh, resource has to be rendered or not. So if I change to example number four, right, you actually will see that, okay, I don't generate this resource. Why? Because I think I had my attention type was none, right? So if I change it to VLAN, I think you, you see that now output is rendered, right? So you can do all these type of things, right? What I did not show here, I saw there is other two very nice attributes uh, that I did not, I, I didn't have here. So one is you can actually fetch a resource, or you can actually set a resource. So there is this concept what uh, in Terraform called um, uh, data and resource, right? So basically, when you do data, you actually do a get. So you basically get a resource. So you could, for example, get the config ref. Uh, have that data and then use, so for example, if let's say you say uh, I put a resource called, uh, so the way that would work is you would give it like input parameters. So the type that you give it would be data, right? Um, you put the same thing. So it will go out to the Kubernetes cluster using a provider plugin. And the nice thing with that provider plugin, it's you only need one because it's all KRM based. So you don't actually have to write any provider at all. Uh, you only need one provider and you can do everything with that. Uh, so in other words, you can now fetch data. Um, and then uh, the result that you get, so if I, so now it will be, so if we would uh, change that to resource, right? I did not, I'm refactoring some of this code, uh, so that's why I didn't show yet. So, but if I would call resource dot I, this resource, and I would say resource dot context, that would be then the data that I fetched, and given that I know the GBK, right? So I know the group version kind in Kubernetes, and I know the schema. I know also I can do validations and all that stuff, right? So that's the other. That's a very nice property. So you can basically fetch data, use the context and then manipulate a workload cluster based on that information, right? Or other resources. And so that's one nice attribute. The second nice attribute that you have is you have mix-ins, which is um, a property that you, for example, to give you an example is we need to get an IP address, right? So to get an IP address, you we have an IP claim, right? So, so you basically write an IP claim and you set some uh, attributes to it, right? So then let's say you fetch, you get an IP address, and that would be a module on its own, right? So you basically write a module. I like we did today, we have IPAM functions. You write a module that is, uh, let's call it specialized in IP allocations, right? Or IP claims. And you can write another one for VLAN claims. So there's no code to be written. The only thing you have to write is actually this file. At, yeah, so these files. And so what you what you can do with this uh, tool as well, I, actually it's also how Terraform works, is you can basically now say, I want to render this package. It's part of your, uh, let's say your, your definitions, right? So in your package, you basically say the type of the resource is, I, okay, I'm struggling with the name. So in, in Terraform, they call modules, right? So we call them packages. But what we actually, I, if you look to the functionality they provide, they are actually mix-ins, right? So you actually mix in the resource within this, right? So, so what you can now do is you make very reusable packages and that can actually inherit properties from each other. So it's very similar to how NSD works with, uh, with uh, Tosca, I think. So it's very similar to that approach. So you can actually inherit that uh, module 
run it, get the result, and then move on, right? So, so that is another nice property because that means that we can actually build very reusable code that uh, will be then uh, consumed by other, uh, by many modules uh, potentially, right? So, so, so in other words, in this, I so when I was uh, ex I, let's say experimenting or implementing this. It turns out, I so one of the challenges I think that we have with kept, and that's also the realization that we come to or have come to uh, uh, right now with the SDK is that we have to write code, right? Even for the kept functions, even though they are small and there's not too much code, you have to write code. Whereas here you don't. So, so I've been able to, I so in my prototype when I did, uh, let's say half a year ago, I was able to do everything we did in specialization using this technology. So without having to write uh, any code. And I, so I, one of the challenges that you have, for example, with cut functions, for example, the namespace that that Tal was saying, I mean, it's nice, it's a good uh, cap function, but they only manipulate certain namespaces in a resource. Whereas here, I, for example, if, uh, within the spec, you also have a namespace and you want to change it. The cap function will not do it. You have to write a specific function for that uh, GVK, whereas here you just set the namespace on the attribute as such. So it's plus, I think it's I what I have gotten as feedback in general. It is way more intuitive to get. And so here you basically, if you look to a cap function, you say, uh, in the package, I render a namespace, right? So, okay, you hope that it will do the job, right? Here you actually see, you know exactly what you're going to get. And if namespace would be somewhere here and you set it, you know exactly that what you're going to get. Whereas that's, I think the challenge that you have with kept functions, in my view, is that they are a bit implicit in what they do and you somehow have to trust them, right? So here you are in control of what, uh, what the pipeline or what the expression language does. So you know exactly what you're going to get, of course, depending on the input that you provide, right? So, so yeah, so that's kind of a little bit, uh, yeah, so that's basically what KForm is and what it does. So it's, I, for people familiar with Terraform, it's not, so, I have used two syntaxes in the meantime, by the way. So one is the syntax that we have inside of packages. So it's just plain KRM resources that you, I mean, you can put them in one file, right? Uh, you could also use another uh, syntax, right? So where they are uh, mapped together, but in essence, they are not uh, anything uh, different than what you see here. It's just a way that we structure the data. Um, if you look to how I how this is rendered, so this basically builds an own dependency tree between the resources. So it actually knows uh, the dependencies that it has. So for example, if you write another resource that has uh, that is dependent, for example, let's say you put in another resource that use uses workload cluster as the input for the next stage. You actually see that you first need to do this, then this, and then the next one. So it actually builds a DAC under the hood and it executes it uh, as is. So it actually yeah does all the dependency management that you have between the executions and stuff like that. So, but that's basically also how Terraform works, right? So from that point of view, it's very similar. I don't use any code of Terraform. Uh, it is uh, all mine, uh, but yeah, it works. I pretty much the same as Terraform. From a let's say an, a consumption point of view, the only I so the main difference is because I use only KRM as a input. That it makes a lot of things way simpler uh, that uh, compared to what Terraform because of the fact that they have their own schema definitions. So you have to remap everything that you have. There is some global plugins of uh, Terraform as well for Kubernetes, but they don't do any any schema uh, stuff. So in other words, you you are uh, you don't benefit from the real schema. So I did in the implementation under the hood, I have uh, done some changes to leverage that whole uh, Open API framework to help in schema validation and stuff like that, which is uh, very nice. So that means that. 
once you write or you have a, an API using KRM, you just uh, basically have to say, uh, actually, my uh, the idea is that we actually fetch the the schema automatically, right? When because you know them when you define your file, you can actually fetch them dynamically. So I did not implement that uh, so far, but uh, that's my thought because then you can just leverage whatever is available on the market, and you don't have to write any code additionally. So that's it. Oh, thank you. Uh, go ahead, Fiacra. Sorry. Cool, thanks. Yeah, just, you probably answered it already. But in terms of the the inputs, so like this example is 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 trivial. But you you you've one inputs and and a and a workload cluster uh, resource. But what's the scenario then if you have like a uh, I'm thinking of a care package or like a, a package of KRM uh, uh, resources, and you yeah. had to you know you had you had substitution values in a lot or all of them. Yeah. Would you, would would you define all of those inputs in a single input vars, you know, in a single config map. You have I a choice. See that getting, well, I can see that getting quite complex, right? If, if you have... This thing uh, doesn't care, basically, Fiacra. So in other words, if you have five input files, right, here, you can you can do, you can split them up uh, in pieces. And so I don't, I just show you one, right? Just to yeah. get the basics, but you can split in as many as you want. I don't care. Okay, and then it, it would, it would then iterate I, I don't know it is it is this within the script there is it is this how, what do you, you see the way it there? works it's very simple right so i mean i under the hood how it works is is like this i use the config map by the way this doesn't have to be a config map either so you can use any resource that you want right so you could use here nephew.org uh blah 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 right so i don't I, I just use here a config map as an input right in essence how it works is this uh, resource, right, which you are going mm -hmm. to run. So let's say you, you create another resource here, right? Workload cluster, and here you say, I want another one, right? Cluster uh, two or something like that, right? Uh, of course, you probably need to give it another name, uh, probably, right? Because otherwise they, they clash, right? So input context. Let's say I take, let's take an, an example here. I create two input variables too, right? And this I give context two, right? And this I give context number one, right? So context and context two, right? Mm -hmm. And I let's say I use another input. Let's call it uh, revision or let's, yeah, let's call it example two or something like that, right? And here we now say that in this cluster, so yeah, so we need to, uh, so you have to basically say input context two like this, right? Yeah. And it will take the data. That's all you have to do. So. And it will figure yeah, yeah. out under the hood uh, how it's uh, how that's rendered. I, yeah, yeah, I understand. I'm, I'm just guessing. I'm kind of coming from a, from a user a user end point, a user's perspective. You know what I mean? In terms of like if I'm comparing the two values that Yama, right? And I probably shouldn't because you know we're we're not nobody's big big fans fans of Helm here. But essentially, it's a substitution, right? So you're, you're substitution value substitute values into. In, into your templates, right? So that's you know Helm Helm template Very similar does, to, does that yeah. quite well. Helm, yeah, Helm does yeah. similar things. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just like you know, ideally it would be all like the input variables would be all defined in a single file. You know what I mean? For me, anyway. Um, instead of having you know one to one mapping between input files one, input files two to workload cluster one, workload cluster. You know what I mean? That that yeah. probably would make more sense, but then but the the the, the size of that file, like you know it, it, that with many 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 inputs could could uh, could get a bit yeah, but, but so so the nice thing i think fiacra is you can split them into so that's the other thing that you can do with this approach uh, with this technology is you can split uh functionality into uh, let's say building blocks so you could write a package that only looks at i have config ref so the date on config ref and you only uh render that right so so you basically you can split that code, right, mm -hmm. or those those packages into pieces. So you could write uh, a package only focused on config refs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what you do then is you basically you render that dynamically. You get the output of that uh, package, right, or that mix in. I I'm still struggling with the name, right. And then you go further. So in other words, you can. So the technology allows you to to split your code or your uh, expressions or whatever you call this stuff, right, into uh, 
let's say individual packages that do one thing and they are focused on that one thing, right? Yeah, so yeah. as such, you get very reusable code, right? Or packages, if you will. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, do do one thing well, yeah, yeah. And just on the output, then is it all? Is it by default that it, it would all get pumped into the one, the one YAML file? You you have a choice here. So so this is the other I think nice tool uh, thing with the tool. I just render out. So I, we were discussing at some point uh, with Stephen. Okay, I want to use it to build a package, right? Offline. Okay, I could fetch data from Git, right, and then uh, use that to basically generate for me a package with the data, with the templates that I have, right? So that's one use case. You can use it in the specialization pipeline focused on packages, and you can also use it in the, I call it the controller runtime as a as a, as a business logic, right? So I don't care how you use it, right? So the engine will execute based on the data you provide, you see? So I wanted to also, I, what you typically have today is you have, uh, I, we have tool here, tool there, tool. So we, I wanted to have the flexibility to use this in various uh, scenarios rather than without me having to write very specific code because any use case that you have, uh, it's KRM in and KRM out. And I don't care what KRM is in and what KRM is out. You just use data manipulations to, uh, to do so, right? That's, the, that's what the tool provides. Yeah, okay, cool. cool. And how you use it, you that's your choice. So if you write one big package with all of the stuff like you were saying, you can, right? Probably not the recommended approach, but we allow I so you the tool allows you also to mix in these packages, which makes I uh, makes the, the code and the, the whole thing uh, way more manageable at the end of the day, right? I think it did, but then in that scenario you, you would have to have some way of, of addressing the dependencies uh question it's, I, between, that's between that's what happened what the tool does right so if you look to the tool how it works it processes these things right so every resource that you see here is actually so it's a variable if you will right so if you look to how the tool works it's every resource you have here it's a variable okay and the variable has this data and what you can do is you can reference these variables between each other and that's how it knows the dependencies right and based on that, it will, so it creates a DAG under the hood and it executes a DAG at the end of the day too. Because in order to consume, let's say this resource, this has to be rendered first before I can use the data here because this is actually yeah. not usable as such, right? So in other words, we have to, this has to be rendered first before the resource, which would be in this case, output.workload cluster, right? So that would be the resource that you reference. And then you uh, you have to render at first, and then you can use the result of that into the consequent, uh, let's say, uh, functions that are, or things that are running. Mm. So the tool does that for you. Uh, I, that's basically what the tool does. At the end of the day, it's, it takes, it, it renders the syntax. It, uh, it, through the expression language, changes these uh, results. So also, for example, if you write, uh, this thing, right? And you haven't, your dependencies were not correct, the tool will tell you, right? So for example, if you have a reference that cannot be resolved, you will see that the tool will uh, give you an error. Right? So there is, so the way it, it works is that it, uh, so it takes the data here, it, it parses it, it checks for, is it syntactically correct? And can I do, all the dependencies that you have put in place, can I resolve them? If not, uh, I'll throw you an error, right? And once that, uh, that is uh, perceived to be okay, you'll have a DAG, right? And then you can execute the DAG, basically. So that's what, what how the tool works. So the tool works in two stages. One is uh, rendering, is parsing the data to see whether it's syntactically correct and whether all the dependencies are resolvable, right? And once we have that, we have a context in an execution context, as I call it, and then you basically execute that. Cool. Okay. Cool. Um, so, so the, the my question is always uh, the the tools, how the tools fit into the SDK context. Um, so, so one thing for sure that I could see is um, the expressive languages. Uh, this is this is one one first thing is to avoid um, having 
the the, the users of SDK, the, the vendors or sites uh, to write code. Um, so you they're expressing this new Terraform-like language, um, Lua-like language, uh, then that that would be mapping resources. So because the business logic, as we, as we said, is basically taking um, taking some resources, NF deployment plus all the vendor extension pieces, um, and map that into values.yaml. So so yeah. that thing is done on compile time. So so this is the tool while executing. Um, yeah. You write that logic in this language. It's fine, um, and then and then that what does what does that generate? So so that so that generates a YAML that filled with expressive language, and then we have to bundle that inside um, the, the 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 so in this case would be the NF package. Um, the way, the way I, I see what you have to do, uh, Stephen, mm -hmm. is right. So so you get NF deployment as input. Yeah. You look over, let's say, config refs, right, or parameter mm -hmm. refs, right, and parameter refs maybe both, right. Mm -hmm. Based on that, you get uh, GVKs, right. Mm -hmm. You basically patch the GVK. So this is com this is this is compile time, business logic writing time. So so you no, do no, know so what the we are, we are know what the the business. supposed to be. Yeah. yeah. So we write this. So in other words, you mm -hmm. the way you I, I'll show you how how to, maybe I can give you an example on how it would uh, how you would write that right. Mm -hmm. I, I did not. I, I first wanted to give you the basics of how. Yeah, yeah of course. Just the, no, no. I mean, obviously, it's not done. Because done otherwise, yet. if we go immediately to the use case, you mm -hmm. I. I, I was trying to give you a, a sense yeah, no, of no, no. That's, that's great. What, yeah. how it works, right? Mm -hmm. So what you have to do is you get NF deployment as input, right? Mm -hmm. Then the next thing you do is you, you loop over the input that you get, right? Yeah. And you get config refs from there, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Right? Then you basically, you fetch them. So this is a resource called data. GPK, right? And you get uh, based on the config ref mm -hmm. that you identified, you basically fetch it, okay? Mm -hmm. Then you get new resources, right? And that mm -hmm. you, let's say, uh, the result is the output is values of YAML, right? Right? Mm -hmm. right. And then what you have to do is you have to, the map, data. Map a, yeah, map a value, map a. So that's map kind a of what you have to do in a not type, type right? Yeah. Correct. Into, so, into into some few in S, and a, NF deployment and then some few in your in your config refs data. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So basically, what you can do, I, so that's basically what you have to write. Mm -hmm. as yeah, a, so that's as the business. That's the business logic piece. So what correct. what does that render into in, in uh, so that does that becomes an executable? Does it becomes a? Oh, so this is just so this is basically. I, so let me show you what mm -hmm. I did at some point. Uh, where is my NF? I do here too many stuff. <laughs> Uh, wait, so I can probably wait. Where did I do NF to infer? I didn't, I did not prepare that use case, I think, mm -hmm. properly, okay. but I'll show you where's the thing here. Is it here? Okay. For example, here, so so this is uh, no, I don't have. This is not a good example. Um, see, this is the Terraform. Uh, so this is the other syntax that I was uh, experimenting with at some point, right? Mm -hmm. Which is very much Terraform, way more Terraform uh, alike, right? So you actually define resource and this and that, right? Mm -hmm. But I. I moved to plain KRM, but I hear at the back it's still KRM. So this is actually more Terraform syntax, right? But mm -hmm. it's the problem with this is that I or I see is that uh, for people with native KRM resources, uh, you have to manipulate it a little bit, which I think is a bit uh, counter uh, productive. But what you, but in essence you do is you could write a config map, right, like mm -hmm. this. And these are this is where your resources are, right? Based on the, mm -hmm. with the manipulation data, with the substitution and the expressions and stuff like that that you need. Okay, mm -hmm. so you could write it into a file where which basically lists resource one, resource two, resource three, resource four. That's your mm -hmm. business logic. That is what you are when you write your SDK. Mm -hmm. That is the config map, if you will, that you supply to that uh, to that 
to that SDK. So that's okay. your business logic. So when you supply to 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 the NF runtime, what it will do is it will render. So like I'm doing the syntax validation, it will render this data and uh, builds an, a deck. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it hooks itself towards your uh, NF deployment. So, so NF deployment is your hook into controller runtime. And mm -hmm. then you hook your this execution context to that hook, to the watch, if you will. Right? OK. So, when so, you, you, do, so you, 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 you have to, you still have to write the reconcile code to hook no, your, no, your, your. No, okay. I mean, wait, so you have to write. So actually, I have a pro, I, I actually build something that does this exactly, right? Mm -hmm. Um, which is I, so I used I I, I don't know whether you remember that a year ago I presented function run right which is mm -hmm. very similar yeah. so mm -hmm. it, instead of using K form as an execution engine it was using functions so each of these steps was a function mm -hmm. the problem with that is you still have to write code at the end of the day right, right. so the functions have to write code so so here it's the same context uh, concept the thing is that you you hook your execution context to the to the watch and then. Mm -hmm. NF deployment is your is the same as my input dot variables that I showed. So that's your input, mm -hmm. and then it basically executes the deck, right? So it executes it. It will fetch the resource, and then till you have an execution thing. So, but what you have to do is you. So what I I do is I wrote on top of controller runtime, a small reconciler, mm -hmm. on which you basically give that execution deck, right? So the deck, the execution context that I said is that's what I provide to it. And how do do you get that? By the config map that you provide. So what what this the tool does it, it parses this thing, it builds a deck, and then when you run your operator, so that's what happens. And then if that parsing is successful, if it's not successful, you get a failure, right? So you will you will not be able to run this operator. You will get a log, right? Mm -hmm. But once it's executed, so you have an execution context, and then when uh, every time you do a watch in the control runtime, so when you get an update or you get the resource, right, the execution tech context will run and it will render, let's say, the values.yaml config map that we need to, to execute the helm charge, right? So that's what, uh, how you have to see it. But so we would have to write that uh, controller runtime mm -hmm. uh, okay. library once, right, that just mm -hmm. takes in an execution context from uh, the DAG that we generate, and then mm -hmm. it just executes. So the, the the code is actually, it's 20 lines. Mm -hmm. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. Okay. So so your 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 DAG, the DAG you generated uh, would be bundled in a package. So what, what the, the DAG you generated so is basically you, you more supply a config right? map. I, so, the simple, okay. I, mm -hmm. so you supply a config map to the, mm -hmm. to the operator. What the config map does, is it will generate that it will actually run the syntax of K form, if you will, right? So it basically runs K form syntax mm -hmm. and it will generate a DAG, which so that code will automatically uh, hook it to the reconciler. Okay. See? So we, we need to install K form on workload clusters. <laughs> that, that, that also so, is part of it. So, so the reconciler, I mean, if mm -hmm. we use this technology, this, so the operator, right, so the extension that we use on, on the controller runtime, so our controller runtime, if you will. Right. Mm -hmm. will embed K form that basically, so the first thing that you do in your operator, when you create a deployment, you say, here is config map, right? So mm -hmm. once it has the config map, it will parse the, it will parse the config map and give it to the execution context. That's basically what it does. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then what, what you, the, the resource you reconcile, you, you do it dynamically. So there would be if, if we if we reconcile different inputs, um, we still so we so, with so, different operators or be same operators because you have different execution. So inputs. so an operator today the reconciler can only watch one resource at a yeah, time. You yeah, have multiple right. reconcilers, of course. So that's why I said. But you have different logic, controllers within the operator, but yeah, sure. Yeah. So this business logic is tied to a watch. So every watch you can have mm -hmm. an own config map, if you will. So in other okay. words, you can have I what I experimented with. Uh, at the time is because what you see is when you do a delete, you kind of have a different, a little bit of a different business logic than when you do an update and a create, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. so what I, in my function runner, what did I do is I actually had a different, I, I had the ability to have a different business logic for delete than for update and create. Mm -hmm. And I could, so mm -hmm. I could, because you have the, 
the children resources that we generate, right? Can mm -hmm. have their own watches. So you can actually build watches for that. So there you can build your own. So I was, I have, I, when I built the function runner, I was able to attach each of these business logic to each of these watches dynamically, such that you render different things depending on the type of watches you get. So it doesn't have to be one config map. Is what I'm saying. Control runtime doesn't doesn't have a delete hook, right? So you you have to go check. You reconcile. So, we have to check uh, if the the delete timestamps. Exist. Correct. So, and that would yeah. be out code. If we decide to do that, mm -hmm. right, to have a different uh -huh. business. So, what I did is what if I get uh, the reconciler, I looked at deletion timestamp set, right? If okay. so, run, uh, run uh, the delete uh, business logic. If no, not, yeah. uh, run the, the update create. So, it's a, that simple, basically. Okay. But, okay. Oh, yeah, no, so good. Kieran, Kieran has a question. So, I'm, I'm still trying to picture putting that together. But, yeah, go ahead, Kieran. Sorry. I did have a question, but then Liam found it out of band. So I was wondering, was this in a few experimental? We could have a look at it and play around with it. But it seems it's in your um, own GitHub repo, I guess, is it? At the moment, it's my own code. Uh, yeah, so I will have to, yeah, I'll have to get you access to, to the, the thing, right? Yeah, so I will I'll work on that, yeah. Yeah, because it, and then it, 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 you said last week that this also does packaging. Yeah, so, I mean, see, there is nothing. So you could write the logic to say, yeah, I, yeah. Do, <laughs> I fetch a CRD from this Git, right? Repo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you write a deployment with a set of inputs, right? So mm -hmm. so it's not any, uh, there is no difference when generating mm -hmm. a package. Yeah, yeah, right. We just have to find the right primitives that we need to yeah, do you have so. To, you have to find the right set of CRs and things that, that get bundled in that one Correct. package. Yeah. It's it's yeah. as simple as that, basically. You mm -hmm. just have to say which resources do I need, which parameters mm -hmm. do I get, are they static, are they dynamic, and if so, uh, you write the expressions that you need to do so. Okay. Yeah, that's, that seems like a good thing to experiment on. Yeah. I mean, overall, uh, for, for, for the SDA sub-team, um, to see, you know, to leverage this and, and, and see, you know, how... So the thing is, I, I really like the, the front end, obviously, to uh, to users. And it's very, very little they have to. Well, I mean, it's a new language, per se, but then it's not. I mean, it's, it's not Terraform. A, so, so the language, yeah. so I, I mapped it a bit, OK, in KRM, right? So, But the mm -hmm. language itself, right? So there is a bunch of attributes here that I didn't show. For example, you can have a depends upon. You can have a for each. You have a count. But if you go to Terraform and you search them, you will see the exact same. And I'm using them in the exact same way. I didn't change mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. But what you see in, yeah, so the difference is that in this syntax, and that's an I, so this would be good to get feedback. Mm -hmm. At the moment, I'm putting them in under annotations, right? Mm -hmm. So in Terraform, if you go to Terraform, they are all kind of, um, if you go to Terraform, they are, Wait, so where is Terraform? Uh, wait, Terraform here. So you see, so here for each, I've used the exact same uh, meta argument. So mm -hmm. you see here count, provider, lifecycle. So all of these uh, arguments are the same, right? So mm -hmm. it's I haven't changed any of this. So people familiar with that, that's why I use Terraform as a base. Because I believe, although the structure is a little bit different, the behavior, I saw the, the context is exactly Terraform. So the people familiar with Terraform will be very familiar with this, although it's a little bit packaged differently. So that's why I decided to use this approach. So for example, modules is the thing that I, this is the mix in, right? So, mm -hmm. But each of these, if where is a good uh, resource? Yeah. To tap upon, right? And there are, yeah, I don't find a good resource. A new main change or something like that. Yeah, here you have to go to the video, I guess, right? So here, I'm not going to play it, but if I. In the last tutorial, you could. Yeah, sorry, I will not. Yeah, so here you see, so the syntax here, so this is ACL, ACL, right? So I'm. So they have they have two formats is JSON and HCL so it's it's more optimal here right but I use just KRM as this right mm -hmm. but the way it's so this AWS instance and app server so this is basically so if you would reference this resource mm -hmm. it is basically 
uh, AI. So in this case, it will call AWS, uh, AWS instance dot app server, right? Mm -hmm. so, and yeah, so it's I, syntactically it's the same, basically. Mm -hmm. So that's the why I I focused on this. So variables for me is inputs. So you say that's input variables. So mm -hmm. I changed the name to input for the time being, right? But here you see, uh, are they here doing expressions? They also don't. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I have a good example here, but so I, it uses the same uh, thing under the hood, basically. So, but my implementation is not Terraform, but I, I, uh, I, I don't use any of the code of Terraform, but I use uh, just the, the concept, I or mm -hmm. the, the flavors. Okay. Yeah, I don't have a, I don't find a good uh, the var dot instance name. You see, var is my is what I called input, right? Mm -hmm. And then instance name right. is the name yeah. of the resource, basically. Yeah, so, your context. Yeah, that yeah it's what I call context. Yeah, but you mm -hmm. can. So I don't care which names you 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 provide, right? So they yeah. just have to speak uh, at the end of the day. So that's one mm -hmm. thing. But uh, the syntax validator will complain. Okay. If you don't uh, do it, so but that's the same with Terraform, by the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so I, I, as Kieran said, if you have oh. luminary stuff that you can check into experimental, one one thing that I would like to try is uh, to to at least put the UPF, um, the free by GC UPF, and see whether or not I can generate from NF deployment. UPF actually doesn't even have any ex, uh, render extensions for us. Um, so, and then and then and 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 map it into uh, values.yaml. That would yeah. be that would be a good thing to do. Correct. Except you'll see. Any other? I'll, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll have a look at it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, five minutes over. So uh, um, anyone has anything else for Tao or or uh, or uh, Oblin? I, I guess um, we should digest all this and then see how we go forward. If ever yeah, there was yeah. a big, yeah. if, ever, I mean, if ever there was a big yeah. statement, there's one, but. I probably as well for the nephew operators too. Uh, uh, it, it's kind of this is input for both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're not making a decision now, but then obviously we have to experiment to uh, to see uh, which one or or some other third approach if we have um, to do, or or even yeah. maybe some combination of the two. Yes, that's yeah. possible. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting discussions ahead. Right. Well, well, thank you, Tao and uh, and Vim. That was great. Thanks. And, uh, thank you guys right. for attending. So we'll uh, right. we'll be soon next week. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.